Councillors, before we get into the formal part of the meeting, this is a bit of a red socks day, and uh, I think it would be nice just for us to acknowledge the, the effort that Russell Cook's put into running the event. Um, I suppose that's a little bit of a payback. Uh, and for Ian Taylor and his team from Animation Research, who's given us all those fantastic images of the race. And of course, Team New Zealand, who've pulled it off in fine form. So, at least you feel I shouldn't, I'd like to be able to send a letter to those people, um, thanking them and congratulating them as it is appropriate. Um, and definitely encouraging Team New Zealand to bring the cup down here for a bit of a celebration when they return. Okay, moving on. Um, apologies. Uh, I have apologies from uh, Peter Cull, who's on Council Business, and Councillor O'Malley. O'Malley. I'll move that uh, those apologies be sustained. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Confirmation of the agenda. Um, I'll move that we confirm the agenda with the following alterations. In regard to Standing Order 21.1, option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking of amendments. And secondly, that items C3 and C4 of the non-public part of the meeting be taken before item C2 due to the availability of speakers. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Wilson? Any debate? If not, I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Declarations of interest, councillors. Um, I'll move that the committee notes or amends, if any of you have an amendment, the member's interest register as, attached, as attachment A and confirms or amends the proposed management plan for members' interests. Seconded, Councillor Wiley. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Confirmation of the minutes. <coughs> I will move that Council confirms the public part of the minutes of the ordinary Council meeting held on the 30th of May 2017 as a correct record and that the Council confirms the public part of the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting held on the 15th of May 2017 as a correct record. Do I have a seconder? Council Lord. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carry. Uh, the minutes of infrastructure services. Councillor Wilson. It's getting down to that point. It's probably the electronic forms. I'll, I'll, I'll move the um, minutes as per the order paper. Seconded. Councillor Hall. Any discussion? Not I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carry. Community and Culture. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I move that the Council note the minutes of the Community and Culture meeting held on 13 June 2017 as a true and accurate record. Seconded. Councillor Elder. Any debate? If not, I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Planning environment. Councillor Vincent Pope. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I move the, the Council notes the minutes of the Planning and Environment Committee of 13 June 2017. Seconded, Councillor Stedman. Any discussion? If not, I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Minutes of the Community Boards, Waikawaiti Coast Community Boards. Yes. Councillor Wiley. Uh, Councillor Staines, um, I would like to move that we move all eight of the Community Board minutes. Are you really comfortable that we move them all as an omnibus? Seconded by Councillor Elder. <coughs> Any discussion? I'll put it. All in favour? Against? Carried. That brings us to... Agenda item number eight, I think, isn't it? Eighteen. Eighteen. These are. It's eighteen. Yep. To eighteen, the review of the camping control bylaw, two thousand and fifteen. Some staff. 
Can everybody hear me? Yes, it's definitely on. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Uh, today we are seeking your approval to consult on potential changes to the Freedom Camping Bylaw. The current Deleting City Council Bylaw is recognised nationally as best practice and it does provide opportunities for all types of camping in different parts of the city. That's not to say it hasn't been without its challenges, most particularly at our unrestricted sites, which are at Ocean View and Warrington. Those challenges we have addressed through spending close to $100,000, plus we have additional infrastructure changes that we are planning to make in the coming months before the next camping season. Those changes would be irrespective of whether we proceed with changes to the bylaw. Further to the uh, unmet demand that we are um, seeing at our unrestricted sites, there are changes to the guidelines for certified self-contained vehicles. These come into effect on the 1st of January 2018 and will have the effect of basically no longer certifying <laughs> What's the word? station wagons with portaloos. Instead, certified self-contained vehicles will be what we traditionally call motorhomes. With the result of the increasing demand and those pending changes which are likely to result in far more demand on our unrestricted sites, it is timely to review our bylaw and our approach, particularly at this time which will give us enough time to be able to make a decision, should a decision to change be made, to implement it for the next camping cycle. Essentially we have three options. One option is to restrict to certified self-contained only. The second option is to continue with our current approach or an enhanced status quo, which is to provide for unrestricted camping in the two locations. Or thirdly, is to extend our existing approach, which is to provide more opportunities for unrestricted camping. Changing a bylaw requires a special consultative procedure. It also requires us to consult on a draft bylaw. As such, we need to put a proposal to you and a recommended option. It is our recommendation that the draft bylaw is based on restricting to self-contained vehicles only. However, the consultation will enable us to provide to obtain feedback from the community on whether this is the path they want to go down, whether they want to continue with the path we already have, or whether they want to open more unrestricted sites. Rather than considering site-specific criteria, we are interested in hearing from the community on what matters to them, and as such we have included a set of criteria to be considered and for the opportunity for the community to put further criteria forward for us to be able to bring to you. Changing a bylaw does need to be in response to an issue or a problem. Unfortunately that means sometimes our statements of proposal do come across as being quite negative because you do have to be assured that a bylaw or a regulatory response is an appropriate response to a problem or an issue. The staff have received in excess of 300 complaints in respect of Ocean View and Warrington <coughs> since Christmas. There have been letters of complaint to our local MPs and there have also been numbers of letters to the editor of the Otago Daily Times. It is these issues that we are responding to. My colleague Jindy is going to run through the approach to freedom camping to, with our neighbouring councillors, councils, as this is this is good to, to give you some context because, of course, our, our campers don't necessarily appreciate it when they change from one area in the region to another. She's also going to run through what other camping opportunities are available, and then I will go through a timeline from here. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under the Freedom Camping Act, local government um, councils are able to make bylaws to prohibit areas of freedom camping. Under Section 12 of the Freedom Camping Act, they cannot restrict Freedom Camping Act. Uh, in the context of the Otago region, the Clutha District Council in 2012 passed a bylaw that 
was only certified self-contained vehicles only. They are currently going through a review or planning to do a review by the end of this year. Um, and I don't have an indicative idea on what direction they are currently looking to go down. At the end of 2016, the Waitaki District Council changed their bylaw to also allow only certified self-contained vehicles for a maximum of two stays at some specific sites, but also in residential areas, which is the opposite to Queenstown's approach, which allows certified self-contained vehicles in specific sites in urban areas, but not in residential built-up areas, so the likes of Streets of Arrowtown, Streets of Queenstown, no campers are allowed to park and stay overnight. Uh, Christchurch District Council, well, not district, sorry, City Council, towards the end of 2016, also changed their bylaw to allow only certified self-contained. In recent times, <coughs> excuse me, in the media, the Tauranga City Council has taken a, a very, very different approach to a number of bylaws across the country wherein that they are restricting and prohibiting to only allow certified self-contained vehicles across 35 sites um, in the in the Tauranga region. That's probably one of the most drastic bylaws and approaches to freedom camping um, at this stage in the country. Uh, a lot of this is coming from um, discussions at, at the National Forum uh, where Councils are dealing with a number of the similar issues that we are having and that we've outlined in the report around 24 of the high number of vehicles. The recent uh, announcement of the change of the standard of freedom camping vehicles, which will mean a number of the vehicles that you see on the roads at the moment that have the, the blue certified self-contained vehicles as of the 31st of January next year will no longer be considered certified self-contained. Uh, which does have potential to put additional vehicles on the road that are non-certified self-contained. Uh, one of the more innovative uh, new approaches that's come through is the Kiwi Camp um, concept that some of you may have heard of, which is running in Blenheim, which is a private commercial uh, operation where the uh, sorry, uh, where campers can go and stay. They don't pay to stay the night, but they t pay to utilise a small fee for a hot shower, to do washing, to charge cell phones. And uh, as staff have had some very high level discussions with th these uh, operators. And it is an approach that has been working quite well in Blenheim at this stage. The process from here is we will consult in July. Um, there will be hearings in later, uh, late in August and there will be a report to the Council in September, October to uh, adopt a bylaw. Uh, if the recommendation is to continue uh, as, as we are, that will not um, require a change to the bylaw. Questions, councillors? Councillor Vandermas. Thank you very much for the additional information. Um, uh, um, Ms Stokes, you said that the complaint that you're responding to, uh, that there have been 300 of them uh, in, in the Warrington area, uh, and that um, that is the reason that you've gone for the recommendation one in, in this particular set of options. What I was wondering is that rather than responding just to complaints, because you'll always have those, why is it that you haven't responded more to the Warrington um, uh, Community Board, uh, who have logged more than 11,000 visitors? And given that you recognise that the problem is just far too many in one place, why is it that you haven't recommended option three to provide additional areas for non-certified self-contained vehicles? Uh, the, the complaints are really just an indicator of the un, unmet demand, and it is the unmet demand that is one of the drivers for recommending recommending the change. Um, staff do believe that we have, and as I explained, we have spent nearly $100,000 on infrastructure investments and addressing the issues uh, in, in Warrington, and staff have been in close um, communication uh, with the community board. Our, our belief is that... Uh, in terms of seeking feedback from from the community, that we are best to start from a uh, a restrict as a proposal, 
and then move through into a providing more options. We believe that, that um, rather than starting with the problems associated with unrestricted, that actually we, we start at, at the other end and we work through on a, on a principled basis. Do we want to provide, do we want to welcome some? Do we want to welcome all? Do we, and where do we want to welcome them? Given that they're coming anyway and that our information is that there will be even more of them from like next October, what do you think is actually going to happen to the 10,000 vehicles over seven months that are no longer legally able to do what you're proposing under option one? I would expect that uh, those vehicles would be found in one of our 11, 11 campgrounds um, across the city. There are um, alternative options for these people. The economic argument around people who are choosing to accommodate themselves in that manner um, these days is, is reasonably questionable. And providing free places to stay uh, when we have plenty of other opportunities for people to stay at low cost uh, in rate paying businesses, that's where we will find them. Do you really believe that our existing camping ground, the low cost options, can cope with more than 10,000 additional vehicles in the six month summer period? We understand that there's existing capacity within campgrounds at present. We also believe that people aren't coming to Dunedin because they can freedom camp, people are coming to Dunedin for other reasons. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in your introduction, um, Ms. Stokes, you talk about the current um, bylaw that we have as being best practice. Um, has, has best practice changed, or are we shifting away from it with the proposed option um, as, as per the statement of proposal? No, we really just seek. We were just trying to put together a statement of proposal that would elicit a broad range of. Um, a broad range of responses um, and going with down the self-contained route which is consistent with our, our neighbours as the, as the proposal um, we believed was the simplest way to do it. And I certainly applaud going with the least antagonistic option as the starting point, not that you would say that, but it doesn't exactly answer my question. Is the proposal that's outlined in the statement of, is the preferred option as outlined in the statement of proposal, would you still consider that as best practice in the way that you would consider our current, the status quo as being best practice per your introductory remarks? Best practice is defined by the National Forum as providing opportunities for all campers. We would be making a change from that if we were to restrict self-contained only. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your very informative uh, introduction, both of you. Um, was it considered uh, as part of the criteria to include wording around not being in built-up residential areas, which doesn't seem to be covered by the residential and commercial accommodation criteria? Uh, we can certainly um, look at the wording. We also appreciate that they aren't necessarily grammatically perfect or necessarily in the present tense. Thank you. Um, and uh, the, do you have any idea of the exact capacity um, of the campgrounds? And um, you may not know that off the, on the hoof, but... <coughs> no, not at the exact capacity, but we do understand that there is existing capacity with only Tahuna being full when there's a major event in town. Thank you. And my third question is, um, given that uh, the recommended option is already operating on the Otago Peninsula and has been since the 2015 review. How do you see that as having worked um, for that area? We certainly feel that it has worked very well uh, in terms of the issues that were identified by the communities previously. Um, of course the peninsula has the luxury of um, there are other places that campers, ca campers can go but certainly um, the enforcement patrols and the feedback that we're getting is that it has worked well. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor L. Thank you for all the hard work you've done and all the hard work you've done over the last season in correcting a lot of what's been happening at both of you and Warrington. Um, it has improved significantly. In fact, um, 
vehicles parked and non-self-contained vehicles parked in restricted areas because of what you've done have gone down from 296 to 87. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Now, uh, because of that, of course, we, our freedom camping sites have been well, well received, so there has been a 37% <coughs> increase over the last season of non-self-contained and contained vehicles to those sites, which indicates that, in fact, they are overcrowded at times. Um, but I, I consider, as um, Vanderby said, that what you've done is considered best practice. And I see that the issue, um, I, do you believe the issue is overcrowding rather than um, the other? And do we need to put in more sites? Put two, section two with <coughs> section three in the sense of if we accept freedom camping, then we have to accept it's overcrowding and put those two together. Um. The issue is demand, and the changes in the guidelines uh, are likely to aggravate that demand, and really the, the council needs to make a decision as to how far it wants to go um, in, along the spectrum in providing opportunities to meet that demand, or whether it just wants to leave it to the commercial operators. Mm -hmm. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, this is a tortuous topic, and I, um, I think you introduced it very well. You're doomed if you do, and you're doomed if you don't. And um, where the nature of the Local Government Act and bylaws setting um, sets us on a course that sounds negative, and um, so I appreciate all of that. I'm just wondering if, if we're really clear about the demographics of the people that will likely be in the non-self-contained, and where they're at, and the opportunities that, if we don't provide for them. Their way of communicating where they are and what they're doing in the world is quite different and we don't measure that necessarily as far as advertising and um, publicity of the city. And it's not really dealt with in this report, but I'm just wondering if you've got any measure for social media and how they portray Dunedin in that, in that particular market that we may be excluding in this process. It is very hard to quantify, but, but certainly the the risk associated with going down the uh, self-contained only route is that we will, or we run the risk of going back to people will camp, and that, but rather than being shepherded, if you like, into areas that um, we know and can reasonably control, um, that that will be spread across the city. So, sorry, do, do, we, do we understand the demographic, though, of those ones who choose to do non-self-contained? I mean, generally they're presumably going for the cheaper option, they're probably younger, but the opportunity that may be lost if we don't provide for that. So I think you, you're talking about the, the value that you get through the younger campers posting pictures on Facebook back home to their families and their parents, etc. Yes, we, it's very, very hard to quantify, and, and the argument, and, and something that's discussed nationally a lot, is that people travel around in their cars and stay very cheaply, and then they come back with their families in years to come. And I think that will still continue, regardless of what changes, if any changes are made to the bylaw. I think it's about that the key to, and looking at the numbers and how they've reduced in our infringements, I, I would attribute much of that to the education program and communicating with those people through their apps and the social media and media on what our restrictions are. People are still going to come to Dunedin, regardless, I think, of, of what our bylaw will end up saying. I think there's, there's plenty going on in the city to attract tourists. Okay. The second part of my question is, and it's a fraught one to do through the bylaw process, but is there any opportunity to look at areas that may have a capacity to service this outside of the DCC controlled area and or you know what you, you gave the example in Gladham of someone setting up other sites what are the opportunities for anyone to do that on private land um, and what are the I mean it sounds good but obviously there's other bylaws and regulations that they also have to meet presumably if they went down that line Yes, there are certainly opportunities for private providers, and the staff have um, spoken with a number of people who are interested in, in looking at um, providing opportunities. 
um, it's fair to say that a, a lot of these have, um, their enthusiasm has waned once they've understood what it actually involves. Uh, it is important to note that council's bylaw does only apply to council-owned land. Um, the campgrounds reg campground regulations would apply to those private areas. But staff are more than happy to work with um, and facilitate um, private providers of camping opportunities. Mm. Councillor Elder. I was just wondering, um, Ruth and Tendi, is there any conversations with DOC around um, what's happening in that space? Because I think central government does have a part to play in this. Yes, absolutely. And, and there has been discussions with DOC since the initial bylaw was adopted. Uh, from DOC's perspective, it's ensuring that they can identify some land, and I know they are looking around the city at where they can put in some DOC campsites. They work very, very well uh, up around Tiana and Milford. Uh, dot camp sites are, are a good model and we would very much um, be supportive to work with DOT and continuing to try and find some areas around the Dunedin city that we could work with them to do that. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Jindy, um, Camper Mate is pretty popular with a lot of the Freedom Campers, whether they're self-contained or non-self-contained. Um, have you been able to get any um, extensive data from them? And then I'll add a follow-up question. Is um, I also see that they've just included uh, an ability for people to list their driveways uh, on, the, on the app. So I'm wondering how that might fit in. I'll tackle the, the camper mate part of your question first. Campermate is the one of the most popular um, camping apps. There's also now Rankins and Wiki Camper, and there's a, there's a fourth one that escapes my mind right now. So whilst we can communicate with all of those, there's not one central app that all campers are using. So, and there will continue to be new apps developed as um, app developers can see value in providing that data. <laughs> with regards to uh, providing people's uh, driveways um, as options for camping, that would be a, a, a completely outside the, the bylaw scope and would be um, something that I wouldn't envision Council would drive. I have had an indication from Councillor Lord that he would like to move the resolutions in the paper and Councillor Wilson. It's a slight amendment, take 2015 now. Sorry, 2015 needs to come out of B. Yep, they're great, thanks. That has come out. So maybe if we could get the resolutions up. Um, Councillors, we can open the debate. Everybody's comfortable. Councillor Gary. Well, the first thing that I want to say is that we're about looking after the residents, certainly and ratepayers, but we're also about welcoming visitors to our city. And uh, I acknowledge the complexity uh, and how vex vexatious this issue can become and is. I want to again acknowledge staff and particularly that this is considered so highly and I've seen evidence of that at a national level. Um, it's considered as best practice what we have done to date uh, and the way we have done it. I'd like to also acknowledge the Wakawaiti Community Board and the other um, the other uh, pu uh, public forum submitter uh, for the positive way that they uh, submitted to us today. We've been let down by central government. Um, this uh, act, the original Freedom Camping Act, came in so quickly and we've been left to carry the can. Um, I also just want to acknowledge who Freedom Campers are. They're young people under 35, often internationals, and they're often domestic visitors over 55. So let's not think that they're all young people, and uh, let's not think that they're irresponsible. Because in fact, on, in the majority, despite the few incidents uh, of negative uh, kind that we hear about, they're in general terms responsible visitors and travellers in our country and to our city. Um, I've been through this issue for nine years at a community level and there's been some observations that I have made. Um, it bothers me entirely to see the divisive way uh, it pans out in a community and rolls out when we come to talk about this issue. And I've certainly seen that played out in the McAndrew Bay sense. Um, 
What we have now, though, uh, after working with the staff, is a very <coughs> smoothly operating bylaw in the sense of the target population, uh, where non-self-contained vans are restricted. Um, and it does operate and no longer is the, that tension between the residents and the visitors. And I welcome that because what we can't have um, is residents feeling resentful about our visitors and treating them badly. That's not acceptable in any way, shape or form. And I was very pleased to see, and don't often agree with the ODT, but I was very pleased to see the editorial which uh, makes the comment um, residents should not feel alienated in their backyard, but visitors should not be alienated either. Um, so, reluctantly, because I'd like to think we live in a world where there's tolerance uh, and we accept people and we don't get hysterical about uh, this hysteria about visitors and groups of people, um, but sadly that is what happens. And the name calling is something that I find particularly offensive when it comes to our visitors. Uh, and the comment I'd make to the community, and I welcome that we're going out to consultation uh, with this proposal, the comment I would make to the community is that when you're making submissions and giving us feedback, um, I have no problem with a logical, well-articulated argument, but I simply don't want to see the name-calling of our visitors that we've had to date. It's not acceptable. So I will be supporting the preferred option. I certainly um, accept uh, and support us going up for consultation. I think it's important we do hear from the community. Um, but I'm supporting the preferred option because I believe it can be made to work well. And I believe we'll finish up with a situation where we welcome visitors, um, campers are managed well, and we can get on the business uh, of going about our lives, but also about welcoming the visitors to the city. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, um, Mr Chairman. I think this is probably a procedural uh, point of order. It's just that in relation to the point that Councillor Gary just raised, the preferred option is contradictory in that in the options it's the first one, but in the document, the statement of proposal, there's still a typo that shows the third option as the proposed one. So can I assume that the preferred option is option one in both and it will be stated such in the statement of proposal? Thank you. Yes, Councillor, I apologise, I meant to cover that in my introduction, that um, there was a mistake on page 124 of your agenda. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. In, in, in the purposes of consultation, um, I, I, I believe that having preferred option for number one actually points people to an option. I would prefer not to see preferred option in, in that, and therefore it's a more open debate. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, and Councillor Gary raised uh, the wider uh, national context, and I think it's um, important to note as part of this debate that uh, we have um, a national tourism strategy, and I use the term loosely, um, that our, our government has put in place to double tourism in the same way that we're doubling dairy and doubling all sorts of other things um, and, and focusing, on, focusing on the sheer uh, volume and throughput as, in, as, the, as the, uh, the end unto itself, uh, in which case um, we, under the framework under which we treat tourists the way we do any other extractive industry, whether that's dairy um, or oil and gas or wherever, um, where volume is king um, and communities are left to cover the externalities of those industries uh, and to pay the costs um, that, that are incurred um, by the ever-increasing numbers uh, in those industries. And I think the question for this community is um, not, not so much are we prepared to pay for that, but to what degree uh, are we prepared to pay for the cost um, of ever-increasing numbers as per our national tourism strategy that we are expected, uh, increasingly expected, uh, to deliver on. Um, we've heard that the, the issues are really coming from unmet demand, uh, which means essentially the status quo is untenable, um, which leaves us with two options through the, the consultation process. Um, one, 
allowing us to be more welcoming of more people from a more diverse range of backgrounds uh, and one uh, other option that isn't the status quo uh, that will make us less welcoming to fewer people um, from less uh, diverse backgrounds. Um, and that's, uh, a, that's a, an interesting debate and I look forward to it being had. Um, I don't think it's necessarily useful to have that here, but that will be that is the fundamental question um, for the for the city really as we go through this process, uh, and and I don't put it to um, the community as a whole uh, to have their say about how welcoming uh, we are prepared to be and to what degree we're prepared to invest uh, in that uh, in that welcoming, um, and I look forward to uh, the debate through the hearings process and ultimately uh, the decision when it comes back to this table in September. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I thought I would just, um, regarding your um, comment that you would prefer that we didn't have an option, I just thought you might like to know why we have to have one. Um, we, we have to, in order to carry out a special consultative procedure on a bylaw, we have to have a draft bylaw, and therefore the draft bylaw has to have one of the three options included in it, so we've started with effectively the simplest bylaw and the ECP will give us an ability to add to it. Thank you. Councillors, I have no further people indicating they wish to speak, so Councillor Lord, your right reply. Thank you. Yeah, um, no, I actually are just interested in Councillor Hawkins' comments, but um, these people could almost be determined gypsies the way they travel around, and we just don't want to be moving them <laughs> along. So, um, so my, my, feel, in my, my feeling <laughs> is that this is a very complex problem and this is one way of addressing it. And by having a special consultative uh, process, we're going to find out the feelings of our community. And it might be that they're adversely against this, or it might be that they're totally supportive, and at least one way or another, everyone will get the chance to share if they wish. Thank you. Councillors, I'm going to put it. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? No. Recorded, please. Recording. All right, that's passed. Um, we're moving on to item 19. Please. 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 Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Hawkins. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor Newell. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Steadman. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Um, Councillor Wiley. Aye. Councillor Wilson. Aye. Carried 12-1. All right, item 19. Art and creativity in infrastructure policy. everyone um, we're just we're really pleased to be presenting this draft policy to you today um, it's a key action within Aratoi to embed art and creativity into the city's decision making and this is a really significant step for us um, we want to uh, take this opportunity to thank all the infrastructure teams um, for their contribution and helping us get this to you today we just would also like to say at times it was actually quite difficult to get staff to focus on developing the policy because of the great ideas that are out there and the wish to just get on with doing doing these things so I think that's pretty cool and um, also that the ambition of the policy is to enable our infrastructure to benefit from the input of our creative sector and that's really going back to the principles of Aratoi which is about cre the creative sector and as an economy driver <coughs> Um, we had just a little quote for you from Winston Churchill who said, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us, and I think that's what we're looking for with this policy. All right, questions, councillors? 
Councillor Vandivis. In paragraph 21 on page 129, it talks about uh, the tracking of infrastructure spend on creativity and art monitored and assessed against the baseline of a 1% spend across all infrastructure projects in a year. This I understand to be a lump of funding basically for art. Does, is it proposed that this funding be spent in that particular year or is it proposed that this goes into a fund which would then be spent as and when a suitable art project came up? Sorry, that, that was the, an option that was considered, but the policy doesn't have that in it. My question was, when it was considered, was it considered that you would simply put, put the money aside and spend it every year? Or was it that it would just go into a fund? Um, different, different places have done it differently. The 1% has been applied in some cities successfully and in other cities they've had issues with it. Some did actually put a budget aside and say that's the budget for arts. Some simply benchmarked their spending on um, infrastructure and said, OK, we've spent about 1% of the budget on art this year. But everyone has done it slightly differently. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. Have, my question really comes down to, do you have a, a model that has successfully worked elsewhere and what <coughs> actually is that model? Can you quote a particular place or...? Well, there's there's several well. places where it has been successful, but they are almost all different. So, for example, in some countries like Canada, it's not only the public sector, but any private sector development that has the 1% applied, and so 1% of the private development um, uh, money is spent on arts and culture and then in other places they did it where they allocated a budget 1% of the CapEx budget and that was some in some places successful and in some places not. I, I think it is about in, to some degree not necessarily the mechanism but the people in place and that is always hard to, to write a policy for. I was hoping for something a bit closer to home and I thought perhaps Wellington might have been a model that you would have wanted to. I mean, I think we have looked at we looked at the Rotorua model where they use one percent, but I mean, when we had a conversation with our um, financial analyst, um, the the query around that was that we would potentially could potentially limit some projects if we put that one percent blanket across the whole lot. If that makes sense. But to answer the question, um, we're looking for a, su a successful model to follow. Do we have one, or do you not really think there is a successful one we can follow? I think what we've tried to do is look at a number of successful models and bring them together for our city. Councillor Gary. Yeah, thank you for all of your work on this. Uh, it's so exciting and I'm delighted to hear that you're brimming over with ideas because I know people in the community are too and we have some of them in the public gallery today. <coughs> Page 134, um, 6.5.1. I just wondered if you could tell us a little more about who will be commissioning and, and organising the installation of the because I would have thought that would have been the art advisors, but I see that's not the case. That's my first question. My second question, uh, I'll, I'll wait till you've asked the first one. So I am the sponsor of the policy, and the arts advisors are part of my team. And so, But we would work in a cross-council way to look at the nature of the infrastructure project, what type of art might be easily able to be um, you know, developed at the start and then um, commissioned appropriately after taking advice from the, the people. Yeah, but, 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 but the infrastructure teams are, will probably be the ones taking the lead. But the arts advisors will be very... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is a collaborative cross-council approach to how we deliver this. Thank you. Um, and 6.5.2, um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about this. My concern is that many of in our uh, arts community are not approved uh, DCC contractors and it's a bit of an obstacle for them and we've heard that I think during the consultation for Arotoi. Um, 
It's obviously there for good reason in terms of health and safety. But could you just speak to that a little bit? More? Um, I think we would see this as an opportunity to be working with the creative sector in different ways. So there'd be opportunities for um, artists to be subcontracted through a contractor who was already doing work. There'd be opportunities, we're hoping, for artists to collaborate within a, um, within a legal way and be able to p potentially be a, a sort of collective to umbrella um, this kind of work, and then we also see the opportunities for artists to be coming through our system and to be getting on board as approved contractors over time. So it will be a sort of a learning and um, education process for all of us. So, our, if I may, our arts advisors will work with the art, art, artistic community and with our health and safety staff as well. Again, it will be another bit of cross council work where we engage with so the community. True. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and my final question is around the public art framework um, that's going up for consultation soon. I know there's real interest in that because of this. Do you have any time frame for that? <coughs> it's up for consultation now, isn't it? Without checking, um, the framework's out for another month, is it? Uh, July 3rd to August 11th. Yeah. So going out soon. Yeah. Excellent. <coughs> thank you very much and thank you again for all your work on this exciting proposal. Councillor Hawkins. Sorry. Um, um, two questions. I thought it might be helpful, perhaps, if staff wanted to briefly outline what the operational... I didn't want, didn't want to use the word operationalisation, um, but I did. ...of this <laughs> policy would look like. What is this... How, does it, how will it manifest from a staff point of view? Sorry, we've, we have worked through quite a. Um, we've worked through the process with the infrastructure <coughs> teams, and primarily it would be um, a meeting before the beginning of the financial year where we'd look across the portfolio of, cap of capital expenditure and work and um, infrastructure projects. There'd be a process of identifying which projects have the most potential for some kind of arts or creativity element to be put in. Uh, that work would then go forward with um, set out leads from both the infrastructure team and the arts staff. And we're looking to broaden the arts staff input um, outside of the community arts advisors because we recognize that there might be quite a lot more work in that space because of this policy. Um, there, there will be ad hoc projects through the year and those would come into the process at a later stage and just be looked at at that point. But any once the project leads have been identified, the art element would be part of the infrastructure project. It wouldn't be separate to it. It would be tendered as part of the infrastructure work. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering if we could get an idea of... Um, if staff had any examples of times when we wouldn't... Uh, use this policy on an infrastructure project, um, aside from resourcing, because when we don't have enough resourcing, staff will obviously come and ask us for more. Um, but uh, aside from that, are there other, le other legitimate reasons that you would see where we wouldn't take this and why you haven't suggested a, a, a uniform approach to all infrastructure projects? I think we, we really wanted to have a flexible policy because some projects there may be a, a number of reasons why you might focus some of the arts sort of um, efforts on those projects maybe they're in areas that are very accessible to the community um, because of their geographic location or the, the use of them um, so I think we didn't want to say every project has to be has to have this element added into it and also I think I think Cam McCracken has gone through with you this idea of a collection like the city as a collection and I think that has to be quite carefully curated you can't actually do everything to everything and expect it to look okay at the end so I think it's there's got to be some give and take on what where the focus is and I think that's why we've left it quite flexible. I thank you. <coughs> I'll be to move in due course. Uh, Councillor Ross. Thank you. I'm happy, very, very excited to be able to second, if you need a second. To, um, just delighted to see this um, before us now. Um, the question I have, and the, uh, the city is, has been in the past blessed with other public infrastructure, work, uh, public arts and infrastructure, like the <coughs> dental school, 
Um, there's slight additions to the building, not at the building itself. Um, and the, the latest work of the University of Otago, for example, in Union Street. But there are also other government departments, and I sat through um, a briefing yesterday on the safer roads around Mosgill, Dunedin Mosgill connection, and asked about their public art and infrastructure, and they weren't aware of that policy or anything like that. And I'm just wondering how we can extend this or how this might be reflected when we have dealings with, say, the Health Board or trans Transit with the State Highway 1 project and things like that. Um, are you seeing there being a role for the city in that? Not that it has to be in the policy. Uh, we are hoping that this is a really good model that we could use with other partners um, in the city and we would be working with CDP initially and um, our Creative Dunedin Partnership. Um, who have membership across our kind of tertiary sector and through through um, mana whenua and health and business community. So we would hope that that, that would be the beginning of that um, wider kind of conversation, but there's definitely potential to be working with other stakeholders, for sure. Councillor Elder. This, this is a very <coughs> exciting project, and um, I note that... Uh, infrastructure had put in the overbridge that lovely coloured um, grid thing going up over Cavisham Hill on the highway here, which is a good demonstration of what can be done. One of the, um, the questions I want to ask is, um, is there anything within this that sort of says about um, moving towards some, having a percentage being local artists? I know that New Plymouth says every third year or something and that they go for a local artist. Um, we actually haven't <coughs> got that far down the track with that thinking, but I think that when we would be doing calls for um, work, we would be focusing on our local community as well as the, a national network. Um, the other question is, um, with the same kind of intent, um, some consideration given for tangata whenua and a reflection of, of local Māori culture in, in our art and sculpture? Yeah, absolutely. And that, I mean, that's reflected through the public art framework and, and through Aratoi, which is our kind of leading document. Councillor Vandivis. <coughs> Um, two questions. One is, do you recognise that to date we've been a little bit weak in the sculpture area of the arts in Dunedin? And the second question is, do you think the adoption of the recommended option of this policy gives the opportunity to redress that efficiency in sculpture, in particular, of the arts? I think um, we <coughs> note your comment on that, but we're not, we don't have a view on the, um, on the sculpture in the city generally. But we believe this option um, that's been recommended gives us the best chance of delivering on the, on the framework, on the strategy. Councillor Lafiso. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, kia ora, thank you for your mahi. I, I just have a question in relation to the summary of considerations, page 131, and I'm just um, intrigued as to any feedback or major stumbling blocks to um, when you circulated it to uh, external um, stakeholders, if you like, in terms of engagement. What were what were could have been major um, feedback topics. We actually just have positive feedback about um, people being excited about this work starting to happen. Thank you. Councillor Vincent Pope. Want to speak? No other speakers. I have uh, a mover, Councillor Hawkins, and seconder, Councillor Wilson. So we will go ahead with debate, councillors. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it's really exciting to see this policy in front of us finally um, and having a framework uh, under which we can turn our more prosaic infrastructure uh, into, well, use our more prosaic infrastructure to contribute 
uh, towards uh, making this city a more distinctive and memorable place uh, and hopefully get the best uh, urban design uh, outcomes uh, that we can uh, along the way. Um, I'd like to thank staff for their work in, in doing this and particularly uh, in our infrastructure teams for their uh, enthusiasm and imagination as this work has progressed. Um, not to suggest that we thought it would be any different to that, um, but it was very helpful all the same to, um, to have them all on board and helping drive this and I acknowledge that those processes can often take a little longer than um, many of us would like. Uh, and on that note, um, I'd also like to thank the community for their patience. In April and May of 2012, uh, a sizable group from our community, I was uh, among them, uh, came to council through the annual plan process and asked for a framework or a policy around embedding creativity into the council's above ground infrastructure work. Uh, it was signed off by council in May of 2012, and now, uh, more than five years later, uh, we have it, um, which even by local governments, um, geological timescales uh, is something of uh, is something of a marvel. And I mean, I'm trying not not to be facetious about it. I think we've got to be very careful about the message that it sends to people who make the effort when they don't, don't traditionally engage with council processes to when they actually do that um, to make uh, a little more haste in terms of giving effect to the decisions uh, that we make around that. Um, I too had some concerns around, or a lot of internal debate I suppose, around whether or not we needed to be ring fencing a particular portion of a capital works budget towards this, um, this code of 1% or otherwise. Um, but I think um, staff are right in suggesting that, that you, through doing that you run the risk of it being a, a straitjacket um, that limits you from getting better outcomes when those opportunities arise. Um, but having said that, not having it uh, in here requires, I think, a, a greater deal of vigilance at both an operational and a governance level to make sure that um, to make sure that this this work does continue as it is uh, intended and as it's envisaged uh, by this policy. Um, so so again, um, I thank staff and, and I commend this policy to council and look forward to seeing it in action. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I think it's probably appropriate to compliment the previous speaker on his Rottweiler-like tenacity around this issue. Um, but I think it's also um, inevitable that the residents of the city will come to be very grateful for that. Um, I'd like to thank the staff too for their efforts and also how useful it was to pass those cards around illustrating just how widely the net can be cast around this sort of creativity and imagination. And when you look at those, then I, I think we all should feel a bit embarrassed about the white wooden fences in St Andrew Street and Great King Street. You know, all these things, whether they're traffic islands or buildings or anything else, can be can have elements of creativity and good urban design applied to them rather than uh, the purely pragmatic and often very ugly and unsatisfactory. And so I think this is a very positive step forward and all involved in it shall be complemented. Councillor Gary. I'd like to start by saying the time has come and I think Councillor Hawkins and Vincent, who I understand did a lot of work in the background about this over the years, um, it's a real pleasure to be part of a collaborative and um, collegial council who is in support of the arts because that's the feeling I get around this table. Um, I was involved in the early stages of the Portobello Road, Harrington Point Road safety improvement projects and, and as part of that one of the recommended, recommendations the community made was that art should be embedded in that process, that there should be space left for a sculpture trail um, along the way, and that it didn't all have to be expensive. Imagine the paint that I learnt you can get, apparently a lot of people know about this, I didn't, that only shows up in the rain. And if we had poems painted on the walkway cycleway that only showed up in the rain, not an expensive artistic uh, touch, but nonetheless a creative one. Um, so it doesn't have to be expensive. 
Uh, the point that I would make um, too is that we need to be brave when we come to the implementation of this. We need to make it memorable, <coughs> and I was really pleased to see that word um, in the report, and we need to think outside the square. Um, imagine a tide clock. Imagine um, a sculpture such as there is in Spokane in Canada where there's a figure waiting for the bus and it's called Waiting for the 205 Bus, and it's dressed up on festive occasions, be it Halloween, Christmas, birthdays, etc. Um, all sorts of possibilities, um, but I would encourage us to be brave. Um, this will give our local talent, and my goodness, don't we have a lot of it. We have amazing artists in this city, and I was thrilled to hear that you will be focusing on them, because uh, we certainly have the talent here. So my commendation to all involved in getting this to council today, I will certainly be voting for it, and I'm very excited about what's ahead. Council, before I give Councillor Hawkins his right of reply, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. I think this is actually a red letter day <coughs> for us as a city. Uh, we have a wonderful Scottish city. We have wonderful heritage buildings but we have plenty of what I would call dour areas of our city. And if this policy helps us to get some art and interest into those areas, that light those areas up, then I think it helps us on our path to being recognised as one of the world's great small cities. Uh, it, it, these things don't have to be expensive, as Councillor uh, Gary has said. There are all sorts of ways to make our city that little bit more interesting, that little bit more colourful um, for us as residents and for our visitors. So I definitely support this. Councillor Hawkins, your right of reply. A right of reply? Okay. Uh, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Now, we move on to adoption of the 2017-18 Annual Plan. process for 1718, uh, the adoption of the plan. So um, following the deliberation process in May, we have put together the final plan document and that is before us today to be adopted. So I have any questions? Questions, councillors. Councillor Vandivis. On page 173, I'm glad to see that we have some debt graphs. Always very keen on graphs because they do give you an idea of what's really going on when tables of figures aren't that uh, uh, available to a lot of people's uh, scrutinising minds. My question is, underneath the council term debt graph, which goes out to 2018, why is it the group term debt only goes out to 2015? Why isn't there a projection of the group term debt? <laughs> Given that it's the group term debt that's the bigger, more worrisome one. Um, I'll just follow that up, um, but I don't think we have the group debt budget for the 17-18 year, but we can make sure that that chart goes to 15-16. I will check though for you which year we can take the group to. Okay. Um, you do have some figures if we go through to um, uh, Dunedin Council Treasury. Uh, they have projections. And the Dunedin Council Treasury projections for term loans, which would be, I think, quite close to uh, term debt, 
um, increase um, uh, to 683 million uh, to 2020. Now this is an increase of almost a hundred million dollars. It's in one part of our uh, uh, paperwork, that is to say, the Eden City Treasury um, project projections of long of uh, term loans. If we are planning on raising that amount of money with term loans, surely we must also have an idea of the debt that those loans cover. And that debt appears to be going up over three or four years of, of nearly $100 million. Even. Uh, can I, I'll just reply to that, thanks, councillors. Um, so that debt's arising from, obviously, Aurora's changed uh, capital management plan. We were only advised of that when the statement of intents were finalised last week, so obviously it wasn't in time to inform the budget pack that we sent out as part of the annual plan. Great. Thank you very much for that, because that was uh, a lead into my next question, and that is that, uh, and I've asked this question before, and that is where in our annual plan does the nil dividend from the companies appear? Where does, in our annual plan, recognition of the $720 million that is intended being spent by Aurora, mostly on deferred maintenance over the next 10 years? I, I, I went looking uh, in the annual plan to try and find where this massive spend might be hiding. And on page 170, under non-current <coughs> assets, I looked at uh, shares in subsidiary companies. And uh, I'm wondering if someone could enlighten me to say why it is that in the annual plan 1617, we're looking at $230 million. Uh, but in the forecast, we're only looking at $115 million a change of $115 million. These are massive changes, uh, changes that I don't see highlighted, changes that I don't see actually where the money's coming from. And I'm wondering if the massive spend proposed by Aurora, is that somehow reflected in the big change in value of the shares of sub subsidiary companies? Um, and, and, it, and if it's not there, where do we find this massive change? The last time I asked the question, uh, I was told that we hadn't yet been formally advised that this massive change was going to happen. But we don't need to be formally advised when we know that it is happening anyway. And I would like to know where it's highlighted in this annual plan. Uh, through your worship, um, Councillor Lee, so the annual plan document is um, reflective of the council's capital expenditure only. We haven't reflected um, any of the capital expenditure of the council-owned companies. Um, what you'll notice with those lines on that page, page 170, is there's also another line there called loans and advances. So if you looked at those in total, you'll, you'll see that... It isn't a change as a result of the, ch the um, change in capital expenditure of Aurora. It's just a categorisation that we've used, um, which is different in some of those years. So can I just maybe reply to that, Councillor? Um, the two numbers need to be joined together. When, they did the long when the long-term plan was done, the, um, the loan of $112 million shareholder advance to DCHL was obviously lumped into shares and subsidiaries whereas what we're doing in the annual plan is correctly categorising it as a loan in advance. Thank you for explaining that. That explains the, the, the massive change in those values. What I would like to see, though, is how it is that in this annual plan you propose to keep spending on things like cycleways and, and central city development uh, but have continued to grossly underspend on drainage maintenance <coughs> and all of this with a massive blowout uh, in costs in our council-owned companies, particularly Aurora, how it is that you can continue to put out an annual plan which basically doesn't 
take into account the fact that we are not going to be getting dividends uh, from DCHL as, as previous. That the dividends that we were getting of some $23 million a year uh, we're now has since been recognised by his worship, the Mayor, uh, much of it as having been yeah. borrowed, and that, in fact, a much bigger kind of debt in the way of deferred maintenance and aurora is now coming home to roost. I would like to know where in these annual plan accounts those massive and, I believe, almost insurmountable issues appear and why they haven't been highlighted. So y y you might like to note that we are just approving the annual plan and all of these questions got discussed when we did the draft annual plan and all we've gone away since is finalise the papers that you signed off as a council when we did when we were finalising the documents. So we're now just adopting the final documents. These arguments have been had. Um, I know that you have raised many times that you would like the full company's debt position to be outlined in the annual plan and it has been answered to you um, more than once that this is just the council's annual plan and the companies do their own set of annual planning and annual reports, statements of intent. So we have, we have outlined that before. At this point in time for the coming year, where we have expectations around the dividend. You may recall that in my time as Chief Executive or in my time here at Council, our dividend has dropped from 23.8 million at its height to currently 11 million, of which 4 million goes towards this, uh, of which 7 million goes towards the stadium. We manage that without cutting services. We have managed to re-inflation-proof the Waipori Fund. We've managed to start to pay off the $40 million debt pool that was taken on while we overpaid dividend. So we will manage any change to the dividend going forward. At this point, we don't know what that is. So this is our annual plan going forward as it was when it came to last month. Um, with, with respect, Chief Executive, is it not also true that we've managed to underspend drainage by some $10 million, and that we've also managed to ignore the massive uh, forward deferred maintenance spending that is now in the public arena and that is now recognised as being $720 million. Are you talking about Aurora or are you talking about water? I'm, I'm talking about, in the first place, about the $10 million that we've underspent in water and drainage. And in the second place, about uh, future dividends and how there is no way that those future dividends can arrive as they are, are proposed, I believe, in this plan. So the issues of future dividends will be dealt with through the uh, later this year and going into next year for the long-term plan when we sit when we set the next <coughs> ten years forward. And uh, during that time, we will have to wrestle with the idea of dividends where they will be, the debt repayment schedule for Aurora and so on, and we will do so, just as we've met every other challenge as it's come along. With regard to the underpayment, uh, the underspend of our capital, um, in last year we spent 100% of our water renewals capital, it's the first time we've ever done it and it's pretty uncommon in New Zealand government, we're definitely overspent, underspent this year largely because of delay of one very large piece of work, which is which we, we didn't uh, end up being satisfactorily able to, to tender and we are having to delay that piece of work accordingly rather than do it badly. Um, we have stepped up, and as you're aware from the last LTP onwards, we have systematically stepped up the level of uh, a capex allocation for our water infrastructure in order to make up for what has historically been uh, underspend in our, in our water maintenance. So this is a relatively common uh, finding across New Zealand councils and one that the, um, that the government has raised as a concern. Uh, you may remember actually that the Auditor General stood up in Parliament and said that our assessment of our asset, um, of our water asset infrastructure and the need to reinvest in that was, was best practice. And so they um, have expressed some confidence in our, uh, in our planning to put that money, put that investment back into improving our, our underground water, water infrastructure. At this stage, Chief Executive, when do you think we may have actually caught up on drainage infrastructure uh, spending to match depreciation? Uh, one of the things that we... Uh, well, certainly within the next 
within the next annual plan, we will be making good on the difference. Um, we will be, we will be uh, over the course of that ten-year plan, we will be making considerable progress. I, I couldn't tell you the exact date because um, some of the deferred maintenance is, if you like, theoretical, and it's not until you dig up the ground that you that you know exactly how bad things are. And um, we will be making progress, and there's money in the budget for improvements. Furthermore, so not just renewals, but improved um, improvements. Uh, in the infrastructure, certainly um, in South Dunedin. Um, yes, yeah, so at, at this point in time, all I can say is uh, the, the plan is going to make cr progress. <coughs> Probably the thing that will most restrict us is the ability to um, to find contractors that are available and willing to work in Dunedin to do the work, and that's certainly been one of our constraints to date as we've tried to start ramping that work up. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, do I have a mover? Councillor Lord. Second. Seconded. Seconded. Councillor Newell. Debate, councillors. If there is none, Councillor Vandivis. Just further to my questions. I don't believe that it's, it is responsible for this council to go ahead and tick off an annual plan when we have ahead of us a number of issues which are very, very large and very, very negative financially. I think that the um, issues that we have with our council companies uh, haven't been dealt with. I am concerned that despite years of uh, red flags, we still haven't caught up with the backlog in drainage spending for the city, drainage spending which affects people terribly when there is a flash flood or whatever. And that it's irresponsible for us to adopt a plan that fails to keep up with this drainage maintenance, leave alone catch up on the deferred, but continues to spend on more central city cycleways and central city redevelopment. I think that it's... Uh, nice to be aspirational and to be able to think about how we could spend you know seven or ten million on on making the central city look lovely i don't have a problem with that if we don't have much more pressing needs for that spend anyway the difficulties we have experienced in trying to get uh, basic infrastructure spending I think largely stem from the fact that they are largely invisible, they are largely underground, they appear in massive tables uh, which people uh, will find very difficult to actually identify, and that if this council continues to go ahead and plan and spend in the way that it has, we are going to make really serious problems for ourselves in the very near future. <coughs> the issue of whether we actually keep the council companies because some of the major ones seem to have become liabilities rather than assets is one which never seems to get onto the table. The issue of whether we really can actually afford to do what we're doing and the claims that we're reducing council debt are all very well, but reducing council debt when group debt, the debt that we are all actually liable for at the end of the day, is projected to increase massively from now through to 2020. For me, all of these things create a situation where I would like to vote for an annual plan that has some nice things in it. But I think that this annual plan doesn't recognise the truth of where we are going in the whole. And for that reason, I'll be voting against. Councillor Lord, your right of reply. Oh, no. uh, oh Councillor Hawkins, I can spot you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. This is a question of clarification, I suppose, perhaps for the Chief Executive. Um, if we were all, or a majority of councillors around this table, to follow Councillor Vandervis's lead and vote down the annual plan at this point, what would be the statutory implications of that and potentially the associated costs to this council of doing that? 
Well, it certainly would have been more useful to tell us in February. Um, and and that's not to say you didn't, but that the council oh, did not did, voted for you. it in February. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply you didn't. You, you voted against in February. Um, and then we could have done something with it, but, but to propose that we <coughs> don't pass it today would mean that we cannot strike a rate for the coming year, um, amongst other things. Well, we would be in breach of our legal requirements to strike, to set to, to adopt the annual plan by yeah, the end of we June. We couldn't set the rate, for example. We couldn't set the new rates, and we would. We are, we think we've had a quick chat. It would be that you would go into a holding pattern based on last year's annual plan for three or four months while you tried to get, work out what the, you were going to do. It has happened, I think, in New Zealand before, but it is it is unusual, and you are in breach of your statutory obligations. Thank you. I'm good. I'm just hoping that's not going to be the case. I'm Very good. good. In that case, uh, I'll put it. All those in favour? No. Aye. Aye. Against? No. Good board, please. Councillor Vandalus. <coughs> it's carried. That brings us now to item 21, the setting of rates for the 1780s. Questions, councillors. Councillor Wilson. Uh, two questions. One is um, the Strathtyre community, uh, sorry, commercial rate, which is now equal and has come through. I'm just surprised that it's still sitting there in the recommendations and just wondering whether in reality that <coughs> should be a separate commercial rate now. Um, through your worship, yes, we will um, look at having that as just a commercial rate from the next year onwards. I just left it separate because it was the final step. Yep. Um, the second question is, and I had the paragraph briefly a moment ago about the uniform annual charges and the 25% um, that we do as a targeted rate at the moment, and I was surprised to see in there that um, things like the private street lighting was in there to make it up to the 25%. Um, I'm sure, I'm sorry, I had the paragraph, it's near the end. Paragraph 13. Um, okay, I've gone to the wrong page, sorry. Thank you. I'm good. Um, Your Worship, it's on page 295, paragraph 11. Sorry. Yes, um, it is included in there. It is a very small, um, it makes a very, very small difference to the calculation. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, and I, I know we had discussion about the types of rates that were meant to be included in here before and the same with curbside recycling. Are we absolutely sure that these are now the ones that can be categorised as um, under the total, uh, as, um, I know the Regional Council do it differently and I'm just checking that at one stage we added warm Dunedin rates in there as well as part of the, the working out the percentage that is done by um, targeted rates. And I'm just checking that we've done that full analysis again on that. I'll follow up on the street lighting one for you, let you know. Well, I'm actually also interested in the other ones, like curbside, that are included, because my understanding was it, did, it was literally a uniform annual charge that should have been that percentage, not the variable ones, that's all. Okay. No other questions? Councillor Vandivis. I'm interested to know on page 275, which basically summarises the, 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 uh, the general rates and the different categories, I'm interested to know what the value rationale is for charging commercial rate payers 250% more on their capital value than residential rate payers. That's just per our current policy. I mean, obviously, we're looking at setting up a rates working party to inform the LTP, and that sort of thing obviously will be looked at as part of that process. Well, I'm very aware that it's current policy, and uh, I'm also very aware that it's been current policy for a while to try and reduce the 
uh, commercial rate very slightly over a number of years and, and having been here for a very long time I've seen a very small reduction in that. But we still have a situation now where in terms of value for money, in terms of what you get for your rates, if you're commercial you pay 250% more than if you're residential. And this creates, amongst other problems, uh, as well as being, I think, an unfair and unlevel playing field, it creates issues that drive certain commercial operations like Airbnb underground, so that instead of paying commercial rates, people are paying residential. Why? Well, the, to me, I recognise that it's been that way for quite a long time, but I would still like to think that it would be possible for staff to actually have a value rationale. What reason is it that you're hitting the commercial sector for 250% more when they basically have the same water and the same drainage? Um, the business differential uh, councils around the country have a bus business differential of some description, and usually on the basis of um, of uh, economic return to them because of the things that councils do. Um, in this particular case, we have now completed a process of a rebalancing of the business differential to the rates differential. So I think that was last year we yep. reached the point that councillors asked staff to get to. So that has happened. Um, our suggestion uh, and in discussion with um, with uh, some of the other councillors is, and, and it has been talked about at the, um, in, in discussions, is to revisit this issue and look at whether it should be reduced further, and that is on the work programme for the, for the Rates Working Party. Is it possible to include in the work programme a value rationale for how we strike rates, as opposed to Oh, it's just because we've done it in the past. It would be very wise to um, to make a change on the basis of some kind of principles rather than choose an arbitrary number. So if that wasn't part of the work, I'd be very surprised. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, going down now to the Forsyth bar, the special rate of 0 0.0591 cents in the dollar. Um, this has been previously justified by saying that this was the equivalent of the rates that were paid by the commercial properties, few that there were, on that site <coughs> prior to the stadium being built. However, the services that we now supply to the stadium include four large power transformers and a great deal of electric and uh, lighting infrastructure a great deal of drainage and water supply infrastructure that was never there before, uh, State Highway 88 costs. Um, why is it that we continue to, uh, with this very ad hoc, I think, um, capital value um, uh, rate for the stadium, why is it that commercial businesses essentially end up subsidising the stadium when we end up supplying a lot of services to the stadium that weren't there previous to the stadium. Again, this, this is a question that's been raised mostly by you um, over and over again, and the answer is exactly the same. A decision's been made, uh, as you're aware, um, once the stadium was built. Uh, uh, the, um, there was a couple of decisions that were made well before my time around the distortionary nature of having the city having one... Um, uh, a built piece of such high uh, value compared to any other buildings in town, and secondly, the um, level of rates being taken in off the um, off the bare land, uh, and then the, the increase. If this was, if we imposed a full rate on this property, we would then have to give a grant in order to offset that rate, and so a special stadium rate was put in place. Uh, this was in, in in the draft annual plan uh, that we discussed in February. It hasn't changed since then. The rationale hasn't changed since then. What may have changed since then is there's been some considerable discussion on the capital value that this rate has struck on. Can you confirm what capital value has been decided on, given that a number of different capital values were looked at uh, over the last year? Uh, Gavin might be able to give you an idea about the capital values. Sorry, we don't have that number with us. We'll have to 
give that to councillors after the meeting. It'll be great to hear afterwards. And thank you very much for coming your questions. No other questions? So uh, I will move. Councillor Lord seconds. Any debate? Not, I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. So we now move on to item 22, Statement of Intent for Dunedin City Holdings Limited and its subsidiaries and associated companies. Welcome Mr Crombie. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Just good afternoon. Um, statement of intent time again. Just probably a, a short uh, overview just to remind people where we're at. There's a requirement under the Act that the statement of intents are placed before Council by 30th of June, uh, which is the reason for this piece here. So our draft statement of intents came to Council in February, looking for feedback on the way through. We held the Council workshop with the Chairs uh, of all the subsidiary companies to take feedback from there and the feedback that was provided has been picked up. These documents are now uh, with you in their finalised form. So uh, the process is that DCHL has a noted and approved all of the subsidiary companies from there and the DCHL one is with the council from that perspective. I understand there has been a question around um, parent company reporting DCHL and there's a, uh, an amendment proposed to go into the DCHL um, statement of intent, which we're very comfortable with from there. Um, so that's probably the process that we're sitting in now. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can, or we'll forward those on if we want. Questions, councillors? Okay. Councillor Vandivis. Thank you very much for coming along today. On page 306, uh, the paragraph five talks about. Um, Sorry, Councillor, could you just help me with which document you're in? I don't have your papers, but if you oh. can tell me where. Sorry, it's. Um, oh, sorry. Gavin yeah, yeah, can come and help me. Yeah. <laughs> the Eaton City Holdings Limited Statement of Intent for the year 30 June 18. So, yep. And if you go to five, nature and scope of activities to be undertaken. Yep. And then you go in the middle of that paragraph, you've got um, capturing group synergies <coughs> as an objective of the company. Yes. Yep. Will the separation of Aurora and Delta make the capturing of group synergies more difficult, given that they are intended to operate at more of an arm's length? Um, I'm not sure you define that as more difficult. Uh, the group synergies, if we're looking at there, is buying power across the whole holding companies group, so you'd be looking at payroll services, computing services, buying power, fuel purchases, those types of things, health and safety committees, uh, that's in the reality there. So I'm not sure that, that makes it more difficult, it just logistically uh, has another party in the group. Okay, a bit further on down in the same paragraph, it talks about that um, uh, the shareholder of the Dunedin City Council um, uh, if, it, if, if it's to maximise benefit, it may wish from time to time to rebalance the composition of this of its portfolio by purchases of sales in response to or in anticipation of ongoing changes in the marketplace. Is the ongoing change to distributed power generation in the marketplace one that you are looking at? Uh, in this regard, is there a rebalancing of the composition of the DCHL portfolio? Is that being looked at in response to, and you may have seen the uh, weekend um, mix article on page three, uh, which highlighted the massive changes overseas in power distribution as a result of the impact of solar. Are you looking at rebalancing uh, Aurora, Delta, whatever, in anticipation of more distributed power generation. I think I, if I take it in two pieces, we are, there is nothing specific on the table for looking at a rebalancing of Aurora at this time. 
the concept of looking at the alternative uh, distribution networks that are in front of us is certainly in full flight and challenging the whole of the country. Um, I know I personally, along with many of the people on the Aurora board and management team, have been at various of the seminars working through what the different outcomes may look like. You'll be aware that in New Zealand there's a, a significant spread of opinion about where that may lead, uh, from Vector on one side, which is invested in a battery company now, to, I think, Wellington, which has simply said we're 40 years away from this and we're not going to talk about it. Aurora is certainly in the middle of that, recognising there is significant change, uh, but where that lands at this time and what's economic about it hasn't yet been uh, worked through, although there's an, there's an ongoing programme to keep looking at where we're at in those things. Thank you. The questions. Not how do you want to handle this? We've put the whole lot up together. So, Councillor Lord has moved. Sorry, I did have one more question if I'm not too late. We'll just get a seconder. So, Councillor Hall seconds. Councillor Vandivis, your question. Yeah. Sorry, um, moving now to. Uh, Acquisition, divestment of shares or assets in any company or organisation. I'm sorry, I didn't realise I stole you. This sorry, so we're still on DCHL? Yes. Yep. Um, uh, it, it talks about uh, investing in an entity if the investment is considered likely to produce added value to the company. The biggest ever investment while I've been on City Council is now going into Aurora. And my question is, will spending $720 million on Aurora maintenance and development add that same amount of value or more to the company? So I'll put that in, in two guises. The first is the value of a surety of network. Uh, so it certainly adds value through that by improving the network reliability. And from an economic perspective, uh, once the customised price pass methodologies work through with the Commerce Commission, that will add financial value as well to the network. My real question, and it relates really to producing the added value to the company, will the spending of $720 million in Aurora mean that if we were to sell Aurora at the end of the spend, that $720 million would be recoupable? Or are we throwing good money after bad? So, so reiterating, there is no, no programme of sale at present. Um, and uh, anybody looking to purchase Aurora as an asset would take the network uh, quality as a value proposition where they go. So if it was invested in that, that they didn't have to spend, then that value would be recovered. Councillor Lord, do you want to speak to us? Uh, any other speakers? I assume you don't want a right of reply then? All right, so I'll put the resolutions. Um, all in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. brings us to item 23, which is Register of Interest, the proposed changes. Back again, yes. Councillors would have seen the paper um, and will recall that um, in March of this year the question was asked about the form of the register and um, we gave an undertaking that we would take um, the comments back through the audit and risk subcommittee for them to consider. In the meantime staff have looked at what practices in other areas and have proposed a change to how our register is shown. Um, the Audit and Risk Subcommittee have considered that change and are recommending that Council confirms the new approach. This report details that. Councillor Benson. Just going to move it. Sam. 
We have a mover and a seconder. Questions? Councillor Vandervis. Regarding the recommendation that the complete register of interests should be part of the agenda for all council and committee meetings in line with best practice, why is it not best practice only to highlight changes in the register and keep the complete register online? I'm, I'm at this point trying to get ahead of Councillor Hawkins here and, and save quite a large number of trees that seem to appear to have to die for the first quarter of our agendas. We took advice from the Office of the Auditor General and they advised that the register should be published um, on each agenda as best practice, and so that's what we're suggesting. And in aid to readability, we are suggesting that the bold and strike through highlights those things that, cha that have changed, which makes um, the awareness of the things that need to be highlighted for that particular meeting easier to see. So we think this is the, a good compromise and still represents best practice. Given that it's all published online anyway, what do you see as the added advantage for having it published in a paper version uh, here for the very small number of people that would show up? I mean, how, how does this... The agendas are all available online electronically. People yes. can choose to print them out or not. We do have an obligation, however, for transparency and under the Local Government Official Information and Meeting Act to provide public copies. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's related to the interest register, but not specifically to the um, proposals. And it's around the inclusion of council appointments uh, in the register um, in terms of how, I mean, essentially being lumped in with people's business interests or community interests or other ones. Um, <coughs> staff had a view as to the, um, the liability of council appointments on various committees. I'm just trying to figure out whether or not they're actually necessary to be listed, whether they or, um, or not in, in this form, or at least whether they need to be stratified out in some form to indicate that they, because at the moment it reads like um, you, you have personal interests in these committees and such, which aren't was the case, really. Um, if I may, we are refining... Um the management plans and how we describe some of these things so and we will look to work with the councillors who are appointed to some of these organisations to change how we're describing them on the interest to make it clear that they are a council appointment and how you would then manage any interest that may come up if that organisation for example was applying for funding from council um, by way of example. Other questions? I have a mover and a seconder, so any debate? If not, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. I'll move that pursuant to the provisions of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987 to exclude the public from the following proceedings of this meeting as detailed in the agenda. Seconded, Councillor Wilson. All in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried.